how Somalians in the UK support their home country, their relatives? Oh, very big. Uh, Somalis are notorious for, uh, you know, this sense of empathy and compassion for one another. They, if you look at even where they live in London, it's enclaves of uh, close-knit communities. They all, you know, live in the same area, and that really is for them to support each other. Uh, and they have very close connections with their uh, relatives and counterparts back in Somalia. Uh, so when you look at the remittances that they send back, for example, uh, it makes up for a, a third of the country's GDP. It's more than when you combine all of the international community donations, from the aid to development, to project, all of it put together. The diaspora remittances far outweigh that contribution. Uh, and so it's, it's a tremendous life support. For, for the people that are still in Somalia. And when you organized this funding, uh, fundraising for coping with famine, mm -hmm. did you manage to move through this ignorance of, the like, general ignorance of the public and raise some money to help? Oh gosh, yes. I mean, people are very good, generally speaking, not just with Somalia, but people are, are very good to, when, uh, when a, you know, a humanity issue hits hits them. So we, we have a calamity such as the famine. I mean, you know, it, it, it was endangering the lives of 10 million people, this famine. If, if, it, if it wasn't prevented from turning into a famine, it literally would have wiped out South Central Somalia. So it's, it was a huge calamity. And I think one of the, the, the good things about people is that when, at, at the core, we tend to be good people. At core, if you see someone else suffering, your immediate reaction is to help. Um, and so, you know, it's, and Somalis, I think they also feel a, a sense of family, a sense of duty, a sense of uh, religious obligation. Um, and so they go out of their way to, to make sure that they uh, help whoever they can. So the fundraising efforts were actually happening transnationally, you know. It was uh, the, the, the UK community would, would do fundraising together, the uh, Somalis in, in, in the Scandinavian countries, Norway, Sweden, um, Denmark would, would put their uh, income monies together. Even the student population, I mean one of the things that really heartened me was uh, our, our Somali student society here in SOAS. You know, I remember in February they, alone they raised something like 123,000 across the Somali student society. So that itself shows you that they have a real passion, a real hunger to, to help the people out. Um, and so, and, that, and we saw the same thing with the famine that took place in 2011, the famine that happened earlier this year, um, the unfortunate truck bomb attack that happened in Mogadishu back in October. People are very good at galvanizing each other and, and doing something for the greater good. And uh, what is the current situation with famine? Have you managed to have enough products to support people? Yeah, the, uh, the good news is that famine was averted. Uh, so the, the danger of, of, famine, of, fam, of, of the drought turning into a famine was looming between January and uh, May of this year. Uh, and so a lot of the fundraising that was done within the community, within the diaspora community, as well as the donations that came from different international donors, uh, really helped to uh, tackle that so that it doesn't turn into a famine that wipes people out. That being said, uh, we still have an issue of people living too close to the poverty line and, and, and below the poverty line. So what's happening is that people have, have not gone into a famine where they die of starvation, even though a lot of people have died. Uh, it, I think you know the, the numbers that have been recorded are well over a couple of thousand between January uh, and May, but the majority of the people have been saved. But what we have now is that there's too many people that are now in uh, displacement camps, so the internally displaced, the, uh, they're being helped in those camps, but that means that they are constantly dependent on food assistance, on uh, um, you know housing assistance. Uh, just their basic needs are being met, if at all it is met, uh, and that's happening across the region where uh, people are are displaced. And these are you know in Mogadishu alone, we've got about 1.2 million. So that's the big problem now. People that are living on the brink of starvation, where they're literally living 
hand to mouth and whatever that they're giving that day is what they live on that day but they don't have nothing that's coming in tomorrow uh, and I think that poses a very big problem now where it's it's the other side of, of, of the humanitarian assistance isn't it where you know humanitarian assistance is very good when you are in dire need at that moment but at the same time when you continue to respond with humanitarian need and don't provide means for uh, self-sufficiency for that person it creates a dependency culture you know uh, and so people continue to be on the brink of starvation Mm -hmm. What do you think is the U.S. interest in Somalia? That's a very good question. I think the main interest is uh, the activities related to the war on terror. So the main concern for them that they say is uh, the uh, terrorist activities of Al-Shabaab which is a terrorist group that is uh, mostly active in Somalia, but also in parts of Kenya uh, and, and other parts of the Horn of Africa. Now, there's two problems with this. One, this general idea that terrorism should be wiped out from, from, from our world is a noble one and a needed one. We all need to feel safe and secure in our own homes. One of the ways that the US is doing that is by uh, doing airstrikes uh, and targeting what they consider to be Al-Shabaab bases in South uh, and Central Somalia. What this is causing is indiscriminately affecting the civilians that live there. So they would say that they're doing an, an airstrike, they would carry it out in a region that is known to be Al-Shabaab territory, but the airstrike doesn't just wipe out that one person or wipe out that uh, military base. It affects the entire area for however many kilometers and miles uh, across. And so that continues to feed into the displacement when people lose their livelihoods. And when South Central Somalia is, uh, is, is largely, especially the areas that are controlled by Al-Shabaab, is largely rural. So you're, you're wiping out people's livelihoods, such as their farms and their cattle and their livestock. When you do that, you create people to then flee to the cities so that they can have some kind of donation. And so they're feeding into the displacement issue. The other thing that's happening is that they are supporting uh, the Amazon forces. So these are the African mission to uh, Somalia military forces, which is a coalition of Kenyan, Burundi and Ugandan Djibouti troops, basically. Um, and they fund them financially to carry out activities to um, fight against Al-Shabaab. And the way that they're doing that is by, uh, uh, you know, and I'll give you, I mean, they're doing a heck of a lot of things, but I just want to give you the most pronounced ones that I think are the, are the most problematic ones. So what they would do is they would attack an Al-Shabaab area. Uh, they might go into a city that is controlled by Al-Shabaab. They'll take over. Al-Shabaab just retreats. They don't even fight back because they know these people are not here for the long term. And so they go into the rural areas. Al-Shabaab stays there. Sometimes they stay. Sometimes they, they go. Most of the time they actually leave the city. And they will say, we freed city X. We freed city Y. And they'll go away. But that city, once you leave and you don't create a replacement army that can continue to fight off Al-Shabaab, Shabaab comes back again. And so there's this Mickey Mouse, you know, kind of a cat and mouse game that's going on. They go into the city, they say we freed it, and then they leave and Al-Shabaab just comes back. And that's what's happening. So when I say that this whole one step forward, two steps back issue that keeps going on, this is one of the, the one of the examples. I was in Kismaya two weeks ago, uh, which is a, a, a hotbed for these kind of activities. Al Shabaab controls the rural areas. Uh, the Somali government, uh, particularly the Jubilan Regional Administration, controls Kismayo, the main cities. And so, what you have is a an Amazon base, a Kenyan defense ba uh, uh, defense forces that have a base there. The Ethiopian have a base there, and the Americans have a base there. Their base is in the University of Kismayo. And so the students and the faculty are displaced within their own city. 
they have to rent out accommodation in order for them to continue teaching. So on one hand they're saying we are fighting against terrorism but at the same time the activities do not allow for progress to take place. If you are if you're hampering, if you're sitting on a university you are effectively hampering the progress of the people that live there. Education is the number one uh, you know, tool to re-engage uh, and rebuild a society. You educate them so that they can do better and engage in civic activities and stand on their own two feet and find work and employment. So when you stop that from happening, you're effectively not part of the process, the progress. And so these are the problems that are, are, are taking place. And for me, it's, it's not highlighted enough. The war on terror, the, the rhetoric about security and how we have to... Uh, look after ourselves and feel safe is very pronounced but how that's playing out is not pronounced at all. Uh, do you think uh, Western society is responsible for this never-lasting war and if it is so, in what way? I think they definitely have a role to play, um, you know, especially when you look at the way they carry out uh, their interventions. Uh, it's not just Somalia, if you look at the uh, Iraq invasion, the Afghanistan invasion, all of these invasions were, were done and the wars that are carried out are done in the name of uh, fighting terrorism. But the impact it has on the local populations in those areas is uh, extremely vast and long-lasting. To this day, if you look at the, the uh, uh, livelihoods and the quality of life of people in Afghanistan, it's far worse than when they were before 2001 and the invasion took place. The same in Iraq, uh, Saddam Hussein was ousted. Life now for Iraqis is worse than when Saddam Hussein was there. And so, you know, and, and, and if you look at their uh, engagements with, uh, with Somalia, it's, it, it, on one hand, they they say that they're making progress by investing in governance, by investing in security, by investing in the building of the military, training them and so on. But when you look at the way that that's happening, it, in fact, it's causing more fragmentation. So you have um, Somali military, for example, the Somali National Army. You have factions that were trained by Djibouti, factions that were trained by Uganda, factions that were trained by Ethiopia. And these are supposedly they're supposed to come together and be loyal to the Somali government. You see, so it's like, it, it really doesn't make sense in a practical way. An, a, a, an army is meant to be trained by that country. Even if that government is not strong enough, you create an incentive where the training takes place together in one base so that the loyalty can be garnered. But when you have six, seven different countries training different parts of you, you can't expect them to be united. And so this is what I'm one example of how they are taking part of fragmentation. The same with the federalist system. It's based on clan alliances rather than, uh, you know, civic or idealist or, you know, uh, even regional, um, you know, uh, creations. So when you have one clan that is predominantly living in this area and you say that you're a regional administration then you've got another clan over there and another clan over there sometimes it's you know two clans that come together that are neighbors it, it feeds into the problems of what caused the civil war in the first place it was different clans that were fighting each other you see uh, so when you feed into that it continues for people to feel loyalty and alliance with their clan rather than with the national uh, rather than at the national level. And, and so a, a rebuilding of nationhood cannot take place. Thank you. Uh, what is the current situation with piracy? And why do you think the European society let it be? And how much is, is it involved mm. into this criminal yeah. issues? Yeah, piracy is it's one of those very interesting uh, issues. Um, on one hand, the piracy pirate activities have declined it's very, uh, very much. I mean, I think the last reported pirate activity was probably two, two years ago. Um, and so if you compare that to before the international community intervened, uh, you know, back in 2010, for example, I mean, there was something like 50 hijacks a month. Um, and so on that 
from that perspective, they've done well. But here's the problem. What caused the piracy itself? The piracy it didn't just come from thin air. Uh, and so what scholars tend to uh, identify is that uh, there are different types of pirates. It's not just the pirate that goes off and hijacks international ships. You've got fishermen who make their livelihood from the sea. Uh, and so when you have uh, illegal uh, fishing that's being done by these international trawlers. You've got ships from Taiwan and China and Indonesia, uh, uh, you know, the Middle East, even European countries like Spain uh, are, are illegally fishing in their territories. And so that because there's no strong government that can fend off this kind of uh, illegal fishing, the fishermen themselves took that into their own hands so that they can protect their livelihoods. And so they're referred to as, as pirates. Um, you've got illegal uh, waste dumping, uh, nuclear waste dumping that's been taking place for many years. Uh, and again, there's uh, people that have taken responsibility to fend that off and fight against that. Uh, and then obviously we've got actual pirates who are just criminals essentially, you know. They saw this as a, as a way to make money and they went for it. Um, and so it's, it's very um, simplistic to refer to pirates as just that one group because it allows for the underlying issues to be ignored. So now what's happened is that the international community has sent naval forces uh, and naval ships to guard that area so that the maritime businesses can continue to flow and pirates uh, can be... Um, can be tackled uh, and obviously you know that has led to pirates not being able to, to carry out their activities but it also led to the fishermen not being able to uh, get their livelihoods they are uh, the, 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 the naval forces there essentially don't differentiate between people and so any Somali man on a boat is seen as suspicious and people cannot risk their lives so what caused the piracy? A lot of it is still, in effect, uh, still there. And I think, you know, we until we tackle that issue of people being able to sustain their livelihoods, we we haven't seen the 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 issue of chi of of piracy um, having come to an end. I think what we've done so far is put a uh, plaster over the wound, essentially. To what extent do you think the consumption of cut Mm -hmm. has played its role in this conflict? Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a coping mechanism for a lot of them. Um, and so it's, it, it has increased, the longer the conflict has been going on, the, the more use of Qad uh, takes place. Uh, Kenya makes a lot of money from it. Uh, the main, they're the main importer of, uh, exporter of Qad to Somalia. Um, but the Somali government, uh, particularly even the ones in the regions where there's a high level of Qad consumption, don't get enough taxation for it. And so even with the high level of consumption uh, and the devastating health effects it has on the people, the income that you generate from that business is, doesn't make up for it, you know? So there's no economic justification to have that coming in, apart from the businessmen that are, you know, selling and buying it. Um, so that, that's one thing. Um, I think on a, uh, on a personal level, on an individual level, the, it, it, it has led to a lot of uh, people having mental issues. So when you go to uh, places where there's a high level of, of card consumption, they're, they're, it's also synonymous with an increase of mental health and mental mental illness essentially um, and that's the governments don't have resources to deal with that so that's also a problem and then that has led to the fracture of families uh, and so there's an increased number of 
divorces, of uh, um, men neglecting their responsibilities, wi wi women uh, leading the household effectively on their own as single parent house uh, households. And then that becomes an intergenerational issue. So it's passed on to the children and they then grow up and consume qad. And it's just become part of the culture in, uh, in a lot of parts actually. It's become part of how you socialize. Um, so I think it's one of those ticking time bombs that don't pose, don't have a physical, like an immediately obvious problem, uh, but it's going to have uh, a lot of repercussions in the future. What do you think Somalia can do to recover from this from the conflict? No, from, 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 from war, just to make, to build out the country again. Yeah, it's what, uh, what, sh what can be done? You know, on one hand, Somalis themselves do need to take a, 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 a level of responsibility and, and, and be accountable for the actions that they take. That's one thing. But I think that can be galvanized by uh, the international community stopping its intervention. So when you look at the kind of... Because and unless they are willing to, to negotiate with the Somali people to intervene in a way that has a timeline so it brings the intervention to an end and they use that period to train up uh, and to provide sufficient support for the people and the different institutions to stand on their own two feet this unhealthy relationship of being dependent on the international community is going to continue when you look at government officials, all the way to the Prime Minister and the, and the President and the parliamentarians, their salaries are paid for by the international community. And so, you know, when you are dependent on that, you, you are responsible and accountable to the person who feeds you. So this is the essential problems that we need to get rid of, first of all, for people to be able to, to, to take responsibility uh, and, and be accountable to themselves. Secondly, there's got to be a reenactment of civic nationality, of civic duties. People feeling that they can come together in a way that's bigger than their clan and their families. And that's not being done right now. We need to have a, uh, a, a revival of national consciousness. Because when a civil war happens, that's the, you know, the main thing that's broken. It's this lack of connection between two, and you see each other as enemies. That's what civil war is. You fight against each other, and you you know. It's, so it's it's good to rebuild the immediate institutions that have been broken, but the only way that you develop those institutions and the society in general is for those national bonds that have been broken to be fixed, and I think that has to be a Somali led movement it has to be a, it has to come from the grassroots it has to come from the civil society leaders um, and the people that are culturally active the ones that are respected within the communities but for me it's very important that uh, I think not just for me but I mean for the country it's it's very important that there is a timeline for uh, the end of international community engagement uh, for all the way from the NGOs that are active there on the ground, from uh, the uh, Amazon forces that are there, the donations that are being given. Um, it, there's there's got to be a timeline where you say this we, we support you from this period to that period, and after that you're on your own. Because otherwise, this dependency culture is going to continue, and, and that is going to continue to to feed the war economy, which means you know the international community is going to stay in power. It's going to stay employed, uh, and I think that's why they continue to be there. But nevertheless, I will say that they do need to leave, and that's the only way for they're genuine about um, Somalis being able to rebuild themselves and their country to for them to leave, really.